I'm not kidding. I actually read a 247 word sentence last week in one contract. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Insights from Case Text. I'm Mike Whalen. This is the WeWork Kansas City Studios. In this series, I'm talking to friends in the legal industry about writing and how we can help lawyers write a little better. Covering a lot of subjects today, I am with Matt Johnston. Matt, how are you today? I'm doing quite well. Thank you. Good, Matt. I appreciate you being here with us. What we typically do with these conversations, instead of starting with Tell me about your childhood. We start with a rant so people who are watching can know if they want to stick around with us. So why don't you rant for a little bit, a couple minutes. Tell me what's on your mind. When it comes to contracts, so a lot of my practice is dealing with contracts, dealing with clients who need contracts um, of various kinds. And the thing that annoys me the most is just how generally poorly written they are. And I'm not talking about the substance. I am talking about simple matters of grammar, uh, structure, sentence structure, paragraph structure, all of these sorts of things. We are taught in law school to write from an advocacy standpoint, and we are not taught the fundamentals of making sure things are clearly understood. The whole purpose of a contract is to arrive at a meeting of the minds. And we hear that all the time in case law. But for the vast majority of contracts that I read, uh, that I receive from other attorneys, that I work with in terms of forms, they are not conducive to getting to that meeting of the minds. It is a function of you know, crazy language. It's a function of, and I'm not kidding, I actually read a 247 word sentence last week in one contract. These Jeez. kinds of things just annoy me to no end because it detracts from the time that I can spend working with my clients. The longer it takes me to read a contract in order to address my client's needs or concerns, the more time my client has to pay me. And that's not very conducive. Um, a, a client shouldn't have to pay to have a, a professional translate English words into understandable English. And so over and over and over again, I find myself in this position of you know, where is basic subject verb agreement? Where is elimination of passive voice? What is the deal with 100 plus word sentences? It just, it frustrates me and it can be better and it really should be better. Great. So I gather from that rant that you are a lawyer working with contracts. Tell me a little bit about your background. Primarily when I was, when I first started out in, in the legal world, I was a litigator and did a lot of commercial litigation. So read a lot of contracts that were very poor, uh, created a great deal of confusion, which was nice in that it generated work for me, but it's not very good for my clients. When I opened my own solo practice uh, almost six years ago now, uh, I made the, the intentional desire to work with small business owners and they have all kinds of contracts, whether it's their day-to-day -day client contracts or you know, buying a business, selling a business, franchise documents, those sorts of things. So a lot of the contracts, I found myself spending a fair amount of time either explaining contracts or when I started writing a lot of contracts, just making the conscious decision to do it in a way that my clients could understand and that they could explain to their customers. Before law school, I was in transportation and logistics for about a decade. And we dealt with contracts in a very kind of practical way, but really as a second thought, right? There, there was the intention of the, of the contractors, the people who were party to a transaction. And, and then the paperwork just kind of came as a second thought to kind of finalize it. So we were dealing with simple contract like bill of lading and change order and things like that. And in that context, I always felt like the contracts were designed to be as not in the way as possible. But as a lawyer, I felt like the contracts are designed to be as in the way as possible. What is that dynamic from, from the person who's the purchaser, the user of the contracts to the lawyer? Where does that those layers of complexity come from? I think the best way to think about it is a, sort of a disconnect and a uh, curse of knowledge type of thing. 
So from the lawyer's perspective, we have a uh, we have training, we have knowledge, and we have an assumed sort of language about how we talk about contracts. From a customer standpoint, from our client standpoint, and the dealing with their customers, they have a separate level of knowledge and a separate level of need. So I think a lot of complexity starts to come in when the two languages don't meet. And it's not, I don't view it as the client's responsibility to change the way they do business. It's my responsibility to understand their language and to, uh, un to know who my audience is and to provide them with what they need. And I think, I think to a certain extent, we've lost that sort of viewpoint. Um, I don't want to say entirely. I mean, it's not fair to throw all of my colleagues under the, on the bar, under the bus. But I think sometimes we forgot that fundamental aspect of, of writing, which is know who your audience is and what they want. And sometimes they don't match and it's not the client's responsibility. It's ours. Well, I wanted to talk to you about the trend of visual contracts. I've noticed this in my own contracting at home, that there are like I've seen banks and this was certainly true in the transportation industry that we're trying to visually design contracts in a way that, you know, a single page will tell someone the fundamentals of that contract, who's agreeing with who, and you don't have the 30 pages of disclaimers. What's the good and bad of those kind of more simplified visual contracts? I think anything that helps the parties come to an understanding about what it is they are contracting is always going to be a good development. Uh, and if contract drafters, lawyers, um, are thinking about how that is, how that is accomplished and how we're gonna go about doing that, then that's a helpful thing. There is, of course, the problem of ambiguity. Um, and when you start to strip away certain aspects of things, you may run into a situation where it becomes uh, ambiguous. And if it's ambiguous, the language is then subject to multiple interpretations, multiple reasonable interpretations. And then you get into a whole nother set of problems with um, trying to interpret or enforce the contract. So while I am a big fan of simplified language and I try very hard to keep my, my contract short and to the point and understandable, sometimes shorter is not always better. Um, but if you're, if you're designing something that your, cust your client is gonna use with their customers, then it's our job as a lawyer to help design contracts that work for what they need. Yeah, in my career, I've kind of had two mentalities with my family law clients. I would say we need to pre-litigate so we don't have to re-litigate. The idea being that we're going to make an order that's super clear and annoyingly clear, really, so that there's not a breach of expectations later that can create conflict and you got to come right back to court. But really, in the transportation industry, the 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 default seemed to be we're going to assume everybody's on the same page. Again, different contests because these are merchants that are very used to these transactions. But we're going to assume that everybody's on the same page and then, you know, make the simplest contract possible. And only if things fall apart will we go in and litigate it. So it, that model was very much driven towards litigation as kind of the stick. But on the front end, it was let's assume we're together, right? So to get to your point, I think one of the things that really is a factor we need to consider when we're writing contracts is the sophistication of our audience, right? The, the Whether they understand the basics of this kind of contract or are they new to this subject? You, you mentioned a word earlier about expectations. Um, so if you're in the transportation world, if you're dealing with two parties who are used to doing all of these sorts of things, they have that knowledge, they have those expectations that give them sort of a shortcut. So one of the best examples that I heard is if you are starting to learn how to cook um, and you can watch all kinds of videos and things like that, but you don't have the language that a professional chef has. 
that professional chef, when you say saute, they know exactly what that means. Right. You know, they, they understand what those words are, whereas everybody else has to sort of accumulate that knowledge. So if you have two parties to a contract who are starting with the same knowledge, then you don't have to worry about it. You can make the contract much more simpler. And at least in terms of, of buying and selling goods, the, the uniform commercial code really helps. But if you are a customer, if you're a client of mine and your customers are not familiar with the services that my client offers, then you have to do some education. So one example, I, I work a lot with graphic designers and marketing firms and things like that. And everybody needs these services, but they don't know what the language means. And so I tell my clients, we need to define terms in simple language. We have to educate the client as to what these things mean. And you have to have this conversation. Um, and a contract can help, but so can the relationship that the, that the parties are entering into. Yeah, I've noticed this with my own practice and with passing back and forth uh, drafts of documents. In my practice, uh, a lot of times for them to have a meeting of the minds, the client had to read the document, right? And we're seeing a lot of when we're dealing with online contracts now, I'm seeing a lot of things where it makes you scroll down all the way before you can say, I read those terms and conditions. Of course, all we do is just scroll down all the way and hit I read the terms and conditions. I didn't really read it, but yeah. but we're creating all these kind of nudges to use a Cass Sunstein term. We're, we're creating these nudges to make sure that people are reading their contracts. Do you think lawyers have an ethical duty for the purpose of making sure there's a meeting of the mind to get them to read those documents, to maybe sit in an office and go line by line with them? Or do we have the ability to just say, look, if you're not gonna read through it, this is your problem? I think it depends heavily upon the context. It's my ethical duty to be able to understand the contract and advise my clients based upon their goals, their stated goals, their interests, whether those interests are stated or unstated as I see them. It's, I don't really think it's my obligation to sit somebody down in a room and say, you have to read this. Now, I don't practice family law. Um, so there may be a context where if you're coming to a settlement agreement about the end of a, of, of a marriage, everybody really needs to understand every word on the page. And maybe at that point you do have that obligation, but at the end of the day, the client has to own their own problem. And my job is to advise them on what this contract means for them, their goals and their interests. Um, if they don't understand the language in the contract, that's a different question. That may be a question that I need to explain. Um, and, and that would be my ethical obligation. But to, to sit somebody in a room and say, okay, we're going to read through this line by line, probably not a good use of either my time or my client's time. Well, but it's easy to see how these documents become really complicated for the lawyer that feels like, our responsibility is to imagine every possible bad scenario and again, pre-litigate so you don't re-litigate later. It, it's not surprising that these documents get absurdly complicated. How can we do our job of foreseeing the possible outcomes and preventing them while still keeping things simple? Part of our job as lawyers is to think about what can go wrong. And I, I often joke with my clients, lawyers are supremely good at this. We can imagine all kinds of worst case scenarios, but it's also incumbent upon us to think about what is the most likely things that are gonna go wrong. What's the probability of things, these things happening? Um, is it possible that a hurricane can come through and wipe out your business? Sure. Is it likely? Well, in Frederick, not so much. So you have to sort of weigh the probabilities and then either consider uh, a broader indemnification provision, or if it's something that's likely to happen, let's have a detailed procedure for discussing the more probable scenarios rather than simply adding, you know, adding everything to it. Just because it's in the parade of horribles doesn't mean there has to be a float for every possible outcome. Yeah. Well, I do think one of the 
big bugaboos in the contract side of lawyering is this idea of copy pasting of there being these standard forms and and lawyers who are not contract lawyers are just filling them out real quick but on the same level for the purpose of access to justice most contract relationships are roughly the same right leases follow a pretty standard uh form what do you think is the proper role of copy and paste of forms in the contracting industry any, but any lawyer who says I don't use forms is either lying to me or lying to themselves. I use forms. Everybody uses forms. It's fast, it's efficient, and it often addresses the, the legal concepts. So, you know, I, I, I do a lot of plug and play. I do, you know, we develop a lot of forms here that we use in-house. The problem with forms is that they often get used in a very mindless fashion. Oh, I need a commercial lease. Here's a commercial lease fill it out, you know, plug in the, the necessary things and go. Well, that needs to address both the, the needs of the landlord and the client. So you've got to look at the transaction itself and spend a little time making sure that that document actually works for the transaction involved. Um, you know, I, I often hear the phrase, um, this is court tested language. Uh, which frustrates me to no end because if the language was clear, you wouldn't need a court to tell me what it means, <laughs> right? So if it's court-tested language, that language already failed in its primary purpose of being explicit about the expectations. So, you, you know, I, I hear that from other lawyers regularly. Uh, I hear it in a lot of literature and I'm like, it just, it has failed in its purpose. So forms often provide that same sort of time-tested mechanism. And when you're dealing with some substantive issues of law, they're very, very, very helpful. Um, but they have to be used with a mind towards the transaction that's involved. Well, Matt, I appreciate this conversation and I appreciate the context of contracts is unique in the sense that as you mentioned, fundamental to a contract is a meeting of the minds. Most of the time, we don't read contracts, right? I, I always say when somebody puts a contract in front of me, I always say, I'm just signing this because your lawyers are better than mine, um, being that I'm my own lawyer. Uh, so, you know, we tend not to read these things, but it, you know, that meeting of the minds is a fundamental element. So it's an interesting context. But I wanted to shift real quick to kind of Shorter questions and answers, a little more hot CD, um, because we'll use them for other purposes later. Let me get your quick take on just a few quick questions if I can. First, how would you define good writing for contracts? What does good writing look like? Good writing is style, uh, grammar, punctuation that increases the understanding of what's written on the page, that fosters the meeting of the minds. It is short sentences, subject, verb, object, you know, basic things that we learned when we were writing in high school. There's nothing wrong with basic writing. That's good writing. One of my favorite debates in the world of contracts is the definition section. You see people defining words like the, and you've got Bill Clinton saying it depends on what the definition of is is. It's very lawyer thinking. What are your feelings on the definition section of a contract? I like a good definition section. That's kind of nerdy, I admit, but a definition section that's well laid out, that defines important terms, uh, terms of art or uh, terms unique to the contract, that can make reading the rest of the contract easy. Now, you can go off the deep end, and that's kind of stupid, um, defining the and things like that. But a good definition section makes reading the rest of the contract more effective uh, and certainly easier. So in my experience that I mentioned, we didn't use lawyers a lot when dealing with the majority of contracts. Do you think most contracty relationships require lawyers? And if not, how do I as a client determine when do I need a lawyer to jump in and when do I not? I think that 
the more common the transaction and the closer the relationship between the parties, the less you need to have a lawyer. Um, particularly like we're talking about merchants and, and, you know, dealing in goods and services and things like that. You know, we have the uniform commercial code to, to step back on and we should use that. Um, the more unique the transaction or the greater the stakes involved in the transaction, it's probably when you need to have a lawyer involved. Most of my clients, I write them a template for the contract and I say, you can change this except for these sections. Don't change these sections unless you talk to me. Right. Um, and it works for them um, because they can explain the contract to their, their clients, their clients. You know, I work very hard to write it in a way that the average client can understand. Excellent. Well, I appreciate the insights, Matt. If people want to get a hold of you to learn more about good writing for contracts, what's the easiest way to get a hold of you? I'm on Twitter. Uh, it's at msjohnston underscore law. Uh, you can look up Matthew Johnston, but good luck. There's a whole bunch of them running around. Um, and you can also go to my website, mattthelawyer.com and post a message there. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your time and we appreciate you guys watching the insights uh, resources from Case Text. In this series, we're talking about writing. So make sure that you watch the other videos and visit our blog at casetext.com slash blog to learn more about the insights we're offering on writing. Thank you. Thank you.